Hello everyone, my name is Gary and I'm going to go over the process of creating a digital creature or character for uh, use in animation. I used Autodesk 3ds Max 2008 to generate the 3D content for this project. 3ds Max is a high-end animation program used in film production, game design, architectural visualization, and many other fields. So the first step in production is modeling, the process of sculpting an object in the computer. All 3D models contain vertices, edges, and polygons. These sub-object components can be transformed by means of moving, rotating, and scaling. 3ds Max offers many tools for editing and creating geometry, so I'll show a few favorites used often in character modeling. The Extrude tool clones a selection, offsets it perpendicular to its surface normal, and fills in the gaps with new geometry. Here, vertices and edges are being chamfered. The Connect tool creates edge flows across selected edge rings. The Cut tool allows for precise editing of topology. Paint deformation deforms a tessellated surface. I began with a single box, and by using the surface modeling tools, I sculpted a dinosaur. I also downloaded an image from the internet to use as a reference for modeling. Reference materials are very important for maintaining accuracy and proper scale. So now I'll compress several hours of work to about three seconds. So here's a look at the end result of what I modeled. Then I applied symmetry. Finally, I converted the model to a subdivision surface, which is a way of smoothing the model by tessellation. Rigging involves setting up an underlying framework for character animation. To understand rigging, I need to mention the concept of parenting and hierarchies. Let's say that I parent a small sphere to the large sphere. Now if I move, rotate, or scale the parent, the child will inherit those transformations. But if I move, rotate, or scale the child, the parent will not inherit transformations. This is called a linked hierarchy. Bone objects in 3ds Max are simply linked hierarchies. If I rotate a bone up the chain, the child bones will inherit those rotations. I create control objects that will manipulate the bones by means of parenting and constraining. The dinosaur's spine is mostly composed of orientation constraints being weighted between the bones and the control objects I created. The eye I rigged involves using a look at constraint to force the eye to remain oriented towards the targeted control object. Here I'm using orientation and look at constraints to achieve a leg twisting solution. Oftentimes it's necessary to get more control out of an object. In this case, I've used 3ds Max's parameter editor to create custom attributes for the dinosaur's toes. I then use the wire parameters tool and basic mathematical expressions to set up relationships between the custom attributes and the animation tracks they're going to control. Now this custom attribute is controlling the rotations of these bones. To animate using forward kinematics, you manipulate objects up the linked hierarchy. In this case, placing a foot on the box using forward kinematics is quite tedious. And so that's why inverse kinematics is the preferred method. In this case, a history-independent inverse kinematics solver is attached to the leg bones, and by moving the IK go, the foot can be easily positioned. Skinning is the process of associating the 3D model with the bones. So first, I add the bones that will actively drive the skin deformation to the skin modifier's bone list. Each bone receives an envelope. An envelope is a gizmo that allows for editing of surrounding vertex weights of each bone. Vertices per envelope are color-coded for visual aid. Red vertices will be affected 100% by bone transformations. Yellow means about 50%, and blue vertices will be affected around 10%. Envelopes can definitely have an effect on surrounding vertices. Therefore, I include and exclude vertices from envelopes where needed, such as the toe areas.
symmetrical models, like the Sinosaur, can have vertex weights and envelope data mirrored to the other side. Due to their simplicity, though, envelopes only provide a starting point for skinning. Eventually, the vertex weights are baked into the model, and the Skin Paint Weights tool is then used to explicitly set and blend vertex weights for each bone. So in this clip, I'm painting the amount of influence this bone's transformation will have on the surrounding vertices. The model is posed to see how the deformation is going. Some areas of high angle deformations cause problems. Polygons are crashing into each other here, which isn't very realistic. To fix it, I edit the model's geometry. I then apply a morph target, which positions the vertices into the location I modeled, based on the angle between the nearby bones. After skinning, I apply surface qualities, such as texture and hair, to the model. In order to properly place a texture onto a 3D model, the texture coordinates, or UVs, are edited. 3ds Max offers the Pelt Mapping tool, which is great for organic surfaces. With the Pelt Mapping tool, I can define pelt seams, which are shown here as blue lines, and these pelt seams will be used to stretch the UV coordinates. After the pelt pooling simulation is done, I can then use the Relax tool to smooth out any problematic UVs. So in this case, I'm just scaling uh, the UVs to fit within the UV space of 0 to 1, and I'm opening up the Material Editor and toweling the checker map so that we can see more detail. UV coordinates are edited so that the model's texture can be painted onto a flat image. I then render out the UVs for map channel 1 and for map channel 2. The purpose of me creating Map Channel 2 is so that I can mask or cover up the seams that were created during the mapping process. So here I'm using Adobe Photoshop, another program to paint the texture maps for the dinosaur model, using the exported UV images as references. Here's another look at texture painting and filtering. The diffuse map I painted will represent the dinosaur's color. The bump map is a grayscale image that will be used to positively or negatively displace a surface, using the grayscale values for displacement. This is only an illusion of detail, though, because geometry isn't created nor altered at render time. Here's a specular map. Basically, the brighter grayscale values will reflect more light off the model surface. I also painted bitmaps for the dinosaur's fur. This one controls the location and density of the fur, this one controls the color of the fur, and this one controls the relative length of the fur. Here's a look at the hair and fur tools inside of 3ds Max. You can cut, comb, style, do almost anything with the tools available. Here's a look at the completed dinosaur model and the fur applied. So with all this done, I can finally start animating. A keyframe is an entity that stores data. The software interpolates a mathematical curve in between keyframes, creating motion. As you can see, time is represented by frames on the timeline. With the Auto Key button enabled, any change I make at any time will be recorded to a keyframe. I am now positioning the body at frame 50 and 0. I can also clone keyframes, as you can see here. Now I'm moving the other foot and the main waist, right after the other foot stops sliding. As you can see, this foot is sliding out, which is easily fixed by cloning the keyframe at frame 0 to frame 50. Now the foot slides right after the other one. To lift a foot, I simply position the time slider near the middle of the two keyframes and move the foot control up in the z-axis. I can also rotate the foot and even filter out all the other keys except rotation being viewed on the timeline. And now I'm cloning the rotation key from frame 0 to frame 50. Now I'm going to animate my custom attributes to control the toe curls as the foot lifts. Then I reset those values by frame 50 so the curls go back to the default state. During animation, I can edit the trajectories each object's motion creates. 
I can also gain fine control over each keyframe's data by using the Curve Editor. With the Curve Editor, I can apply multiplier curves to existing animation tracks and edit the interpolation curve from keyframe to keyframe. And here is the final rendered animation. There is a nice lighting solution, uh, Adaptive Cosi Monte Carlo algorithm was used to light this scene. And it's got uh, afterburn shading for the particles, which were uh, created with the uh, particle flow tools inside 3ds Max. There's also 3D depth of field and a little bit of post motion blur that was done in uh, Autodesk Combustion using the velocity channels that were exported from the rich pixel format, which can store extra channels. And I will detail some of that stuff in future videos. But for now, uh, thank you for watching, and that's it.